those who are watching by Facebook live streaming tonight, uh, Sister Linda up in Maine, Brother Sajeev in India, and anyone listening in Pakistan, God bless you. And Brother uh, Kevin in China, God bless you. We're going to continue in our Bible study tonight in the book of Acts. I believe we've been in the book of Acts almost a little over a year now, right? June 22nd, June, today, today's the 22nd, right? Tomorrow, it'll be a year, praise the Lord, so you'll be able to be a Bible scholar, once you get your certificates, and if you like a certificate and you want to uh, be a part of that, then we can send one to you if you have been faithful into 80% of the classes and promise to make up the 20 on our website. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to chapter 22 tonight. We're going to be starting in verse 14, I believe it is. Do we have any testimonies tonight? A testimony is God's doing something. Becca, you got a testimony? You look like you have a smile on. You have a testimony? You're just blessed. <laughs> How many are blessed? I'm blessed. You know, when you're going through the fire, when you're going through the flood, God says, hold on, just keep shouting, your walls will come down. Amen? Just like Jericho. You've got to keep on shouting, no matter what it looks like. You know, I had a pretty... Uh, discouraging day today. I don't get depressed, I get discouraged. Because uh, my temperament doesn't allow me to be depressed too long. And uh, I got a little down today. And uh, yeah, I got a call from the fire department on Saturday and I had to go to a woman in distress. Her companion uh, all of a sudden was unresponsive. And I got to the home and found out that he had a massive heart attack and he died. And and so I had to console her for two and a half hours and counsel with her. I did that. And I just came from the funeral uh, wake at 4 o'clock. And she still can't believe it. They had just bought a summer cottage. They were going to, um, you know, just raise the grandchildren. Uh, uh, she was Roman Catholic and they didn't really know Jesus. And um, so I, uh, she said to me, um, will you please come to the funeral tomorrow? And I am, <laughs> I have a lot to do, you know. And I said, you know what? I'm going to put all that aside. I'm just going to go. I'm going to go and do that just to be with her and her family. And, and as a fire chaplain, she said, you know, I want to thank the Faven Fire Department for having you on board because she said it made all the difference you being there. So praise God. When we can minister for the gospel and just be there, it wasn't so much what I said. It was just being there, just holding her hand, just bringing her through those tough times. Amen? If you have your Bibles, open them up, please, to the book of Acts. Hallelujah. One of the most powerful books in the whole Bible. The book of Acts is the place where the church began to experience the gifts of the Spirit, to be able to get filled with the Holy Spirit, to walk in faith. I believe that with all my heart. That's why the book of Acts doesn't have a benediction to it. It's open. All the other books have a benediction. The Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with your spirit or whatever it may be in that benediction. But the book of Acts does not. It's open. It means it's continuation. Hallelujah. Yes, please. Um, so we're going to start with verse 14 tonight. Let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your precious, precious word. Help us to not compromise it. Help us, Lord, to dissect it and to interpret it according to the way and the pattern that your Holy Spirit wrote it. Lord, we, we know that, God, you've given us education and you've given us seminary and you've given us schools, but sometimes even they can miss it, Lord. We pray for your divine revelation and illumination into your holy word tonight. Feed your people with that which you want to feed them with, Lord. And if you want to change it, change it. It's okay. But Lord, we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. For your word will never return void. Your word will stand forever. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, your word says, but your word will never, ever pass away. It will accomplish that which you send forth and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, chapter 14, if not, look up on the screen, it will be there. And he said, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will. Paul is reiterating his testimony here of his conversion. And here he states that God of, of, of our Father hath chosen him that he would, should what? He should what? Know his will. So many Christians don't know the will of God. They, they're, they're, they're like, well, I don't know what God's will is. I'm trying to find God's will. And, and they think that God has got this his will like a carrot on a stick, and when you go to grab it, he moves it. You've got to kind of fumble around and, and not No, We can know the will of God. The Apostle Paul says he, he knew that he should know the will of God. God wants us to know his will. But there's a prerequisite, if you will, or there's a, there's a way of obtaining the will of God. Does anybody know how that's done? Some will say through prayer, some will say through reading the word, but there's another way that you and I can know the will of God, but we cannot know it in our natural mind. Our natural mind cannot understand the things which are spiritual. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says this, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not ye conformed to this world, but be transformed. The word is metamorphosis. There's a metamorphosis. There's a change. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For what purpose? That you may prove what is that perfect and good will of God. Hallelujah. So you've got to be in the word, and you've got to allow the word to change your thinking so that you're not interpreting God's will according to what you think, but out of a renewed mind. Can I get a good amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So God wants you to know his will. And the reason why many Christians don't know is because they're not willing to go through the process. They're not willing to be transformed. You know, let me say, uh, Christianity in America needs a transformation. They need to, we need to go through a transformation so that we can understand and know that the things that are known in the spirit, remember Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But the only way we can understand and get that revelation from him is by having our minds renewed. Because sometimes we think one way and God thinks another. He said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so in order to get God's thoughts, we've got to have a renewed mind. Amen? Praise God. So he says, I, I, he wants, Paul says, I, he wanted me to know his will and see that just one, Jesus, and should as he bear the voice, and I'm sorry, and should us hear the voice of his mouth. How many know that God still speaks today? You know, if you tell people God speaks to you, they'll think you're crazy. They'll think you need a psychiatrist. They think you need to take some pills. You know, and maybe some people are hearing voices and they're hearing the wrong voice. But, you know, people need to understand that God still speaks today. He really, really does. And he, and he speaks to us in, 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 in everyday life. It's just not in, uh, you know, thus saith the Lord, you know, like, like the Ten Commandments. No. He can speak to us every single day, even during our normal everyday things. It's funny because um, today, today I was, I was uh, home and my grass needs to be cut. And, and uh, I have so much to do. I said, I have a guy that comes and cuts my grass. He gives me a great price. Cheap. And uh, I always tip him. I always give him a little extra. And so uh, today, I, 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 for some reason, I just, I just felt to call him, you know. So I called him. I left a message on his thing. And I said, um, you know, Stanley, when you get a chance, come cut my lawn. This, you know, this is pastor from across the street from Mike Golden. You know, just come either tomorrow, Friday, Saturday. It's not, a, it's not a rush whenever you want to. And I'm doing some work in my house and, you know, doing some things on the computer. And all of a sudden, I hear the lawnmower start up. And there he is. So I go outside and I say, hey, Stanley, how you doing? And he says, you know what? He said, you've done this the last two times. He says, 
I, I was on my way home. I was just finished a job. He says, and I just called to check in to see if there was anything available. And there you were. So God does those things. And I'll tell you, ladies, take God shopping with you. He'll save you tons of money. All the time. All the time. I, I'm telling you, he'll save you money. Uh, uh, when I go buy suits or if I need a suit or something like that, he'll, he'll speak to my heart and say, go over here. And I'll go there and sure enough, there's the suit, the color I want, the price I want to pay. Thank you, Lord. You know, he's a, he's, he knows how to shop, I'll tell you that. Take him with you. Uh, you know, the Bible says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. And he'll direct your path. You know, people think you're crazy. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, like just going, getting up. And I, I've said this before. Sometimes following God's will is not always convenient. It's not always convenient. You know, I, I had um, worked Friday night, my little security job I did. And I got out of the New Bedford Yacht Club at 1 o'clock in the morning. By the time I got home, it was 1.30. By the time I got to sleep, it was quarter to 2. And uh, I'm also a part of the Citizens Police Academy here in New Bedford. And so uh, I'm going through that training, and I had to be there at 9 o'clock in the morning. Well, guess what? 7 o'clock in the morning, the fire department calls me. It's an emergency, so I had to go there. So I had to get up out of bed. You know, and I didn't have time to shower or anything. I just threw my clothes on, you know, put some cologne on, and off the door, out the door I went. And here I went to this lady's house I never met before and met the police and the fire department. Everything's in an uproar. She's going... I went through all that for two and a half hours. Then I had to race all the way to South Dartmouth to go to the firing range there. And I did that and then go home and collapse. But you know what? It's fun to do God's will. You know, after it's all said and done, who knows, someday that woman may come and sit in our church and get saved. And it always works that way. If there's no Rebecca, then there's no Milan and Eluj. Amen? If there was no Titleist, there'd be no Rebecca. If there would be no Celeste, there'd be no Jen. That's how it works. If there'd be no dad, there'd be no you. Right? Because he was the one that came to our church first, wasn't he? No, you were? All you came together. Well. Oh, okay. That's how you came. Long story. But everybody has a long story. I and mean, Linda, what? Sunday is men's breakfast, but I can't. Oh, Saturday. Saturday is men's breakfast, by the way. Tomorrow night's evangelism here. My wife's giving me all the announcements. So evangelism's here at 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock. She's my calendar. I'm sorry. I have so much going on. I tell you, I just go, honey, do I have to do this? Yes, you have to do this. What time do I have to do it? 5 o'clock. Okay. I just go. No. Okay. Back to Bible study. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou has seen and heard. I want you to look at that because the Apostle Paul, he was a very educated man. He studied under Gamaliel. He would have a PhD today. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. The Bible says he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Very, very educated, very, very highly educated man. But it says here that he would be a witness about the things he had seen and the things that he had heard. You don't need to be a scholar to witness for Jesus. You don't have to have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a, a, a doctorate degree to witness for Jesus. All you've got to do is hear, hear him and, and, and you've seen him, you've met him, not with your physical eyes, but with your spiritual eyes. When you've opened up the Bible, you've seen him. Amen. Amen. And now, why tarriest thou? Can you just turn my mic down just a little bit? Arise and be baptized. Arise and be baptized. 
every and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, some people read that scripture and think, well, you know what, in order for my sins to be forgiven, I've got to be baptized. Well, my question to you is, was the thief on the cross with Jesus in paradise? Was he? Absolutely. Jesus told him, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Did he jump off the cross and get baptized? No. No, he wasn't baptized. But he was with Jesus in paradise. So the, the clear definition of this is finding out whether that conjunction, and, is what's called a subordinating co conjunction, right? Or a coordinating conjunction. So this is not dependent on the first clause that says be baptized. So, yes, be baptized. And, and wash away your sins. How was your sins washed away? Blood of Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't say, uh, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It's almost finished. They just got to get baptized in water and their sins will be forgiven. Is that what he said? No, he said, it is finished. Testolestai in the Greek. It's finished. It's done. It's complete. There's nothing else that needs to be done. It's complete. Hallelujah. So there's a little misnomer of people thinking that they have to be baptized for their sins to be washed away. Remember, this is speaking in a metaphorical expression. Because baptism, when you're baptized with water, it's an outward, it's an outward testimony of an inward reality. It's already something that you've already done. You're already saved. Jesus said, repent and be baptized. So your repentance being baptized, you go in the water, you're baptized as a testimony to the world that you have surrendered your life to Christ. But you're already saved. You're not baptized to be saved. You're already saved. Hallelujah. Calling on the name of the Lord. And it says, and it comes, and it shall come to pass, and it came to pass that when I was, a, when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. Or he was in the second heaven or the third heaven. Remember he said, I know of a man who was in the third heaven. This is not a, a spiritual trance like the, the witches or Satanism or, or one of the occultic powers. That's not, called, that's not the trance he's talking about. Am I still good here? Hello? Yeah, I'm still good? Okay. The meter's still going crazy? Can you hear me though? Okay. He said, and it came to pass that when I was come again into Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him saying unto me, Make haste, and get thee out quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive my testimony concerning me. Sometimes God's going to get you out of the situation you're in. I remember when I traveled to India, and I was in the midst of thieves, I knew it. God showed me what to do, and I did it, and I was able to get away. He wants to talk to you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Sometimes he'll tell you, don't go down that road. I told you about my friend, a good minister friend of mine. He passed away, but good minister a friend of mine, he took this young man to New York for the first time. And before he took him, he had gone and prayed about it. He says, Lord, where would you like me to take him? Because he'd never been out of New Bedford before. You know, he was just a little Portuguese kid, never been anywhere. So he wanted to take him out to New York. And the Lord gave him seven places to go to. And when he got to New York, the kid was so excited, and they went to all these places. And I don't know what, how where they were on the list, but they walked by the Empire State Building. It was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, the kid said to my friend, he says, he said, Eddie, let's go up to the Empire State Building. Let's go to the top of the Empire State Building while we're here. We're right here. And my friend looked at the list. He said, it's not on the list. And he says, oh, come on. He says, we're here. We can go up there. Nothing wrong. That God wouldn't care if we go up there. He said, yeah, but I prayed, and God showed me where to go. So he says, we, 
ten dollars. The kid was a little disappointed until you know, they got to the next thing and it was happy. Quarter past five that night, if you remember this, a few years back, there was a shooter up on the Empire State Building that killed three people. At that time, on that day, right then and there, he would have been up on the Empire State Building at that time of the shooting. God protects us. But there are times when God says, hey, put your running shoes on and get out of there. Okay. Just like when 9-11 happened, there were several Christians that testified on, on CBN that they got sick that morning and they didn't go to work. Now, God allowed that sickness to keep them home. Amen. God will do these things. Sometimes we can't figure out God, and thank God we can't figure out God, because if we figured him out, we'd be, we'd be gone. And I said, Lord, and they, they, they know that I'm, I, I am prison and beat every synagogue, them that believe on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death. Remember we talked about that? It was the Apostle Paul that was holding the clothes and giving his consent to the death of Stephen. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence into the Gentiles. It just amazes me how God is. God takes David Wilkerson, a little country preacher up in Pennsylvania, sends him to New York City, to open up Teen Challenge. He never takes drugs in his life. Some people say, well, you can't identify if you don't take drugs. You can't identify with people if you haven't gone through the experience that they've gone through. That's foolish. Here the Apostle Paul is a master, if you will, a PhD in the law of the Jewish nation, very highly respected, very highly educated. Some say he was part of the Sanhedrin Council. God sends him who know not the law, who obey not the, the commandments, who know none of the Jewish uh, festivals, feasts, and then takes an ignorant fisherman, Peter, and sends him to the Jews. The reason why is because his ways are not our ways. Amen? I don't have to go through what you went through to understand what you're going through. Because I know the one who went through it all. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit is a great counselor. So when I counsel people, it's not so much on a clinical level. It's more of let's get into the word and see how we can find out what your problem is and fix it. Let God fix it. You don't need a pill. You need, you need the gospel. <laughs> you don't need to take a pill. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, if God wants you to take a pill, I mean, if you have to take a pill for whatever reason, that's okay. You've got to take it. But, you know, you try to seek God and see what God wants to do for you. Amen. Can I get a good amen? And they gave him audience unto this word, then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Wow, what good friends they are, huh? They want to kill the apostle Paul. For what? What did he do? What was his great crime? He had no crime. He had done no great crime. He was preaching the gospel. He was preaching about Jesus. He was testifying about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something, folks, those that are listening by Facebook. You get ready because persecution is coming to the church. Jesus said, I am going to bring judgment to the house of God first. Judgment must begin at the house of God. Persecution is coming to get the church and get the bride ready. Because I don't know about you, but when you get an invitation to a wedding, as the days get closer and closer, you get excited for the bride and the bridegroom. And I'm telling you, we're getting closer and closer to that day of Jesus Christ returning again. I can't wait for that day. Not to escape my problems, not to escape my bills, not, not so I can be, you know, get, get rid of my responsibilities. No. Because I know that that day when he comes, the Bible says it's going to be a day of great darkness. 
It's going to be a great joy for the Christian, but it's going to be a great day of darkness for the world because then the tribulation period begins. He says, and they gave him audience, they lifted up their voice, and they said, away with such a fellow, he shouldn't be on the earth, he should die. And as they cried out, they cast off their clothes and threw dust in the air. That was a sign that the Jews did of distaste, disgust, that they wanted, they wanted this man out. They didn't want him to even live another day longer. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging. <laughs> Roman scourging. You know, with the same scourging that Jesus had with the whips, the bones that were attached to the straps of the whips, and when they would whip the back, when they would pull the back, that bone, the, mat, the jagged edge of the bone would rip the skin open. But God wants you rich and prosperous. That's the message today. God wants you to be prosperous. And he wants you to have the best of everything. He doesn't want you to go out. You're a king's kid. Really? Was Paul a king? Did he have everything? No. He said, I've learned whatever state to be in to be content. He said, I had abounded and I had little. I've had much and then I have nothing. I've been eaten. I've, I've gone hungry. I've been shipwrecked. I've been in the water three days. That's why I, I love these people that want to be apostles. You know, everybody wants to have a title. You know, they're going to have a title. I want, and this is apostle so and so. And I ran into a, a gentleman and he said, I want to introduce you to apostle so and so. And I said, Oh, you're an apostle. He said, Yes, I'm an apostle. I said, Would you like me to pray for you? He said, Yes. I said, good. I said, I'm going to pray that God will sustain you through persecution, through beatings, through imprisonment. He said, stop. What are you talking about? I said, well, you want to be an apostle, don't you? He said, yeah. I said, well, those are the things you have to go through. Made him think a little bit. It's not a place of prestige. It's a place of saying, if you're going to be in that kind of realm of ministry, God is, is not promising you that you make it all the way to your 70. The Apostle Paul, he had his head cut off. James was thrust through, thrust through with a sword. Peter was crucified upside down. And Jesus loved them all. But see, in the world we live in today, you say, well, it's a more civilized world, is it? The only reason why it's a little more civilized is because of the laws we have in place. But let those laws be changed. Let those laws become Sharia law. And you will either renounce your faith or you'll be beheaded. You know, everybody's shocked that be it's right in Revelation. In the last days, one of the ways they're going to kill people is by beheading. It says it in Revelation. Why are we shocked? It's, it's coming right down the road. We know we're in the end times. They're, going to, they're cutting off heads of Christians. That's part of that Antichrist spirit. It's there. It's coming. I don't want to get on that. I don't want to get on eschatology now. Keep me in line. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by him. Now see, Paul was intelligent. He said to them, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? Remember, he had his Roman citizenship. Uh-oh. Now that sheds a whole different light on things. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yes. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. That was a whole other category different. There were those that fought their way into freedom. They had a lot of money. But there were those who were born free during the Roman times. 
But those were the really highly educated people. You see, Paul got, was born free. His family was born free. And some say that's the reason why a lot of people believe he was part of the Sanhedrin Council. Remember, he was doing Rome a favor by killing all the Christians and putting them in prison. Are you a Roman? Yes. The chief captain answered with a great sum of kindness of freedom. He said, no, I was born free. Then straightway he departed from him which stood have examined him, and the chief captain also was afraid. And after he knew that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him on the morrow, because he would have known the certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from the, his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Strictly politics. Strictly politics. Hasn't changed. America needs to wake up. We're making the same mistakes the Roman Empire made. See, Rome was so powerful, they conquered many nations, had many, many countries under their, their region. They were known as the most powerful government in the world. Other nations were afraid of them, just like America. And people somehow have this false sense about America that it'll never happen to us. No nation will ever conquer us. You know, I was thinking about that and the Lord showed me the story of the Trojan horse. Remember that story? You know that's what's happening in America with all of our borders being wide open. It's like the Trojan horse. There are, there are 98% of the good people coming that need help, that want help, that are trying to escape, you know, being executed or hurt. We understand that. But there's no way to vet them now. We can't do background checks because ISIS has taken over Syria and the government, and now they have all the government official, official uh, documentation so they can, they can produce false uh, passports and sell them to the highest bidder. So they have authentic Syrian passports, but they're not legitimate. They're not a legitimate government. So what happens is the ISIS are coming in. Oh, we got a passport right here. There's no way to vet it. So what they're doing is they're sneaking into our country. And mark my words, what I'm telling you, they're planning a major attack. It's not going to be an attack on New York City, on the, on the tower. It's going to be an attack on uh, almost every major city in the United States, all at the same time. They've already talked about the, uh, the attack in the air there where they destroy uh, the microwaves and all that stuff, which would cut out all of our cell phones, all electricity. They, I forgot what they call it. It's a magnetic thing, that the way that they can knock out all of that transmission. All they do is explode a bomb in the air. It, it wipes out all of the uh, satellite networks, everything. We won't, everything will shut down. It can happen. They're just waiting for the right time. So just think for a moment. If throughout all of the United States, all the capital cities, the capital states that have cities, will say that, all get attacked at the same time. They all get bombed. What, the, what strain is that going to do on our workforce? The, the airlines, trains, buses, transportation, everything's going to shut down. The strain on the fire department, police department, National Guard, armed forces, all of those things. We need to wake up. It can happen here. This country is still going to be responsible before God for the 54 million babies that have been aborted. Absolutely. Now, if you're a Christian and, and you, before you were a Christian or while you were backslidden or what, you weren't right with God, you had an abortion, guess what? You ask God to forgive you, you're forgiven. You don't have to carry that guilt. You don't have to carry that shame any longer. But for the person that hasn't, it's going to be terrible. 
And Paul earnestly beholding, we're in chapter 23 now. The council said, men and brethren, I have lived all, in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Well, I mean, he was just making a statement. <laughs> he didn't say anything wrong. I wonder if that guy that stood by him was a Democrat. I mean, come on, you know. I don't see, I don't see conservatives. When Obama got elected, people were going crazy. You know, he, I didn't like him. I didn't vote for him, but I didn't hate him. I didn't go burning somebody's store out. I didn't go tripping over police cars and shooting cops and doing all. Oh, I didn't do all. Did you do all that when Obama got elected? I, I, I don't see any arrests. I didn't see any burning in New Bedford. Anything going on like that. See, the liberal, because the liberal, God's not liberal. But see, when we bring in that kind of thinking, they're the ones that are accusing us of being like that. Dude, this guy didn't do anything. Paul didn't do anything, and he gets slapped in the mouth for making one innocent statement. It, it just... Then said Paul to him, you have to understand Paul's personality. Paul was an apostle, but he had a caloric personality. You know what a caloric personality is? There's different personality traits, caloric, melancholy, sanguine, you know, phlegmatic personality types. Paul was a very strong caloric. Paul could cut you up in a thousand pieces with his tongue and enjoy every piece. That's the kind of, in the flesh, I'm talking about. Okay? That's the kind of personality. And Paul, even though he was a Christian, even though he was an apostle, sometimes his flesh took over. Because he was learning to die daily. He says, I die daily. Well, if he didn't, if he had, was already perfect, he didn't need to die daily. But he says, I die daily. And here's one of the places where he had to die daily on. He said this, look. Then Paul said, God shall smite thee, thou white wall sepulcher. You know, one of those white walls. But sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And then they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Uh oh, now he's going to get another hit. <laughs> Something's going to take place. You, you're going to revile the high priest of God? Then Paul said, Paul said, Where's not, brethren, that he was the high priest, where it is written? See, he knew the word. Understand, Paul didn't carry a Bible under his arm. By the time Paul, by the time Paul was at age 13, he knew the first five books, five books of Moses were made up. All Jewish boys and girls. Because they believed hiding the word in their heart. They believed. They studied. That's all they did. They didn't have TV, didn't have cable, didn't have sports, didn't have all that stuff. They didn't have all that stuff. So they would study. They would be taught. The parents would sit down at the table, and they weren't talking about, you know, is your skateboard working? Do you have enough batteries for your, for your, for your game? No. You know, how are you doing on this thing? How you, no. They would talk about scripture. They would talk about Yeshua. They would talk about the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. They would talk about, you know, uh, the, uh, during the Passover, they would talk about the Exodus out of Egypt. They would talk about Moses. And they would talk about, and so they would talk about the father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and how they, Rebecca came in there, and how, you know, everything fell into place. They would talk about scripture. That's why he knew, he knew this. He says, it is, for it is written, written in the oath, thou shalt not speak evil of the rule of thy people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee 
the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. See, now he's using a little psychology here. Because he knew the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. So you know what you do? You, get, you know, it's like kids. Okay? Mommy, can I have that new PlayStation game? No. Daddy, remember how I waxed your car last week? Remember how I polished your golf club? Yeah. Can I have that new game on PlayStation? Yes. So he goes to Mama. He says, I'm taking Junior to the store to buy him the new PlayStation game. Mama says, wait a minute. I just told him he can't have it. Yeah, but I just told him he could. Yeah, but I told him before he went to you. I, now they're playing each other. And the kid's just sitting back there saying, okay, who's going to win? Right? And I see little Hannah smiling back there because she must know she does the same thing. Okay? But don't they do that? Don't the kids do that? That's what Paul was doing. He, he was playing them against each other. It's called blame shifting. He was shifting the blame now, so guess what? He's going to get the spotlight off of him. Watch. Wow, the time is going by so fast. Then said Paul, oh, let's see, uh, verse 7. And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees uh, arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. They were just telling this guy doesn't belong living on the earth. But because he claimed to be a Pharisee, oh, now he's one of us, one of the boys. We find no evil in this man. But if a, Now watch this. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. <laughs> Man, how their attitude changed in such a short, short time. See, because he was using the situation, God spoke to him what to do, and he did it. When there arose a great dissension, say great, it was a riot. Remember the story I told you about Brother David Diamond? I believe it was in Michigan. He was preaching at a church, and uh, after the pastor invited him out to have a little bite to eat, you know how pastors do that? They, after the end of the service, they, go out and they all go out and have some. He said, come on, we're going to go to Pizza Hut. Went to a pizza hut, so the pastor ordered pizza, and it happened to be beer night. Everybody, the place was packed out. Everybody's ordering, you know, you buy, you buy two pizzas, you get a free pitcher of beer. So people were ordering pizzas, getting free beer, and they're drinking, you know, like fish, you know. So the pastor says, uh, Brother Diamond, he says, uh, would you pray over our pizza? Now, they didn't order any beer, but he said, will you, will you pray over our pizza? Now, if you haven't met David Diamond, you'll probably meet him probably in September. He's going to come. He's a good old southern boy, grew up on a farm, but God uses him. And he's not afraid of anything or anyone. In fact, uh, just last week, he went in for a knee replacement. He had both done at the same time. He's crazy. <laughs> but he says, I'm doing, you know, it hurts, and I'll get through it. And, you know, 66, is he 66? 66. Well, I'll get through it. He said, I'm going to get through it. I said, you going to be okay to come in September? He said, oh, I'll be fine. So I'll be hopping and jumping and shouting, praising the Lord. I said, okay. So the pastor asked him to, to, to pray. What does Brother Diamond do? Gets up on the table. 
That's getting everybody's attention. Hey! I think we all ought to pray over our pizza tonight. I want you all to bow your heads. They all did. And this was his prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll save every drunken, cigarette-smoking, alcoholic in this place and bless our pepperoni pizza in Jesus' name. <laughs> and he sat down. And after he was done, you know, that night, the next day he left, and a day later, the, he got something in the mail from the pastor. It was a cutout in the newspaper. Evangelist causes riot in Pizza Hut. Because after he left, some of the people got angry. Who did that man think he was calling us drunks and alcoholics? And another person jumped up and said, well, we are. That's why we're all here getting the free beer. <laughs> they, started <fighting> with, <laughs> they started fighting with each other. The cops came. and <laughs> the Evangelist starts rioting Pizza Hut. Something kind of like what Paul just did. The Bible says there arose a great dissension. The chief captain, fearing that Paul should have been pulled in pieces, one was pulling Paul this way and that way, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by the force and among them and bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him. Look at this. I want you to know when you go through persecution, when you go through trials, when you go through tribulation, you're not alone. One of the things I used to love when I was a kid was watching the uh, Labor Day uh, Jerry Lewis telethon. I used to watch that when I was a kid. My father and mother used to watch it, and I used to watch it as a kid. And, and when Jerry could move around and he could do all the funny things he did, you know, at the end of the telethon, it was a Monday, you know, nobody was at work, and it was in the morning. Like in the early afternoon, they would close the telethon. He used to sing that song, You'll Never Walk Alone. Even as a little kid, Kaysen's age, I would bawl my eyes out. You ever hear the song? I gave it to Alicia. Hopefully she's going to sing it one day. You'll never walk alone. When you walk through the storm, Hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. I don't know the rest of the song. You have to listen to what she sings. Walk on through the wind. Walk on through the rain. When your dreams all are and more. Something like that. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart, and you'll never, never walk alone, you'll never walk alone, how many remember that, watching it, you never watched it, the Jerry Lewis telephone, you heathen, you, I watch it all the time, remember that, as a Christian, you'll never walk alone, you may feel alone, but don't let your feelings be your dictators. Yeah, but I, I, I really feel it. Well, I feel like God's abandoned me. Okay. What did God's word say? What did Jesus say? I'll never, never leave you. I am with you even unto the end of the earth. I am with you. Who are you going to believe? Your feelings? Which flee one minute you feel this way, one minute you feel that way? Or are you going to believe the steady word of God that says, He's with you? You may not feel it. A friend of mine told me a story of, a, um, of an Indian, native Indian, in Oklahoma. Says when he was a boy, maybe five years old, his father would take him in the woods, deep in the woods, deep in the woods. While it was a little light out, 
and then he would tell them, go pick some sticks up. You're going to be trained. I'm going to train you. You train this child not to be afraid. And he said, he would turn dark. He would go and hide. And his son would be crying, Daddy, Daddy, where are you, Daddy? And he said, the Indian said he would take his bow and he would draw it. And all night long he would hold it so no one would come near his son. And he would protect his son. Even though the child didn't feel his father was there, his father was right there. Even though he couldn't see his father, his father was right there protecting him, even though he couldn't sense him. How our Heavenly Father is there. Even though we don't feel it. Even though we don't realize it. But he I like what somebody once said. God may be invisible, but he's not absent. He's there all the time. We're going to stop here. It's almost 20 past 8. I don't want to go any further on that. We'll, we'll continue in verse 12, 11. Well, let me just read verse 11. He said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also in Rome. And you know what's going to happen then. When he testifies in Rome, that's when he's going to be. That's when he's going to be sentenced. You mean God's going to put me in danger? God's going to allow me to go to Rome and have my head cut off? I would rather die doing God's will then go to hell out of his will. I would rather, and I remember that when I was in India, my first trip I went to India, I went all by myself, never traveled that distance before. God called me to go, I knew it, my wife knew it. I was away from my wife for six months. I had contacted a cold, like a virus before I left, but I still went. Every day I was there, I had a 102 fever. Every day I was there, I had disinfectant. Every day I rode on a motorcycle, miles and miles to get into India. I preached the gospel. When I got to the airport to come home after the six weeks, and they wanted me to leave long before that, when I was four weeks in, when I was three to four weeks in, they said, Pastor, you've got to go home. I said, God sent me on a mission. I'm going to finish it. If I die tonight, I hope that I'll die. I'm finishing this mission. And I stayed. I lost 45 pounds. I was 180, one, what was I, what, 190 something. By the time I came back, I was 145. I thought I'm 60, 145. I looked like a 70-something. I was so skinny. My wife didn't even recognize me when I got off the bus. My eyes were all sunk. I got home, I collapsed on the floor, they took me to the hospital, rushed me to the hospital. I was so dehydrated from the dysentery for six weeks. When I got to the airport, they would let me, they said, you can't get on the plane, you're too sick. I said, I have to get on that plane, I have to get home. I said, I'll be okay, I'll be okay. And as they're wheeling me, and back then in, in India, they didn't have the airport that you have now, they didn't have the airport. They took you to a tunnel like this, you have to get down to the ground like this. The guy was wheeling me in a wheelchair to the plane. And I saw her on a cargo bed. Suitcase. I saw on a cargo bed a black coffin. People lying. I heard the audible voice of the Indian. And he said, Back from Jerusalem. You're going to die. I said, No, I'm not. I said, Remember, honey? God gave me a word in Jeremiah. He said, I'm going to take you back to Jerusalem. And I stood on that word. And that was over, what, 20 years ago? And here I am. And I'm still here. Sometimes God allows us to go through very difficult places. And it doesn't mean he doesn't love us. 
but he's molding us, he's shaping us, he's fashioning us for such a time as this. And I tell you, to live, in a, to live as a Christian today, to be a leader in a ministry today, to be a pastor of a church today, you've got to have something in God, otherwise you won't make it. I think it's since 2013, 24,000 in America churches have closed. And there's not enough churches to make up the difference. Think of that. 24, four to 5,000 pastors a month are leaving the ministry. Because you know why? The way it's presented today, if you're not prospering, you don't have a Rolls Royce in your driveway, you don't have God's favor. That's what they're thinking. So when they go through things and they don't have things and they, they, they suffer for things, they go through times of weakness. We didn't always have everything we had. My wife had to pray her clothes in. She would pray and we would pray for her clothes and God would give, we'd go out in the driveway and there'd be two bags of clothes. They were used. Some of them were undergarments. She had to wear that. That's all we could afford. It wasn't always easy. People look today and say, Whoa, Pastor, you got a lot of stuff. You got a house, you got this. Yeah. Because God is blessed. You know why? Because we're givers. But we have to suffer. How did Christ learn obedience? He was the Son of God. He was the son of God, and he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. What do you think? We're going to just make it through? No. We're going to be tested. We're going to be tried. We're going to be brought through the fire. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they went in the fire. They said, I'm sorry. We're not going to give up on our God. We're not going to bow to your image. And if we're thrown in the furnace, guess what? We're going to be thrown in the furnace. But what happened when they were thrown in the furnace? We throw three guys in there. How come there's four? Never weak. Even weak. But the amazing thing is, they came out of the fire. They weren't hurt. There was not one scorch on their body. There was not one blister. Even their hair didn't smell smoke. Whew, talk about God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for those who came and listened. I pray, Lord, that your word was an encouragement. I pray that your word, which is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, to administer to those in Maine, India, Pakistan, China, Indonesia, England, throughout the United States that are listening, Lord, I pray that, God, you'll bless them. Your word says to stand strong in the power of your might. Help your people to stand in these last days, not to give up. We've come too far to give up and turn back now. Hallelujah. Lord, we're going to go through the Jordan. We're going to make it to the other side. Give us peace, Lord, in the midst of the storm. Give us strength when we are weak. Give us boldness to proclaim your truth. When the enemy comes right up to our face and says, has God said? God promised, but where's the promise? You've been waiting for so long. You are faithful, God. You will bring it to pass in your time. Bless they're going in, they're coming out, they're lying down, they're rising up. Father, I pray, God, that you be with them today. Be with me tomorrow as I go to the funeral and help that woman, Lord, to just with the ministry of presence. Pray, Lord, that she will send your Holy Spirit something different. 
she looks in my eyes, she would see you. I pray, Father, that you will minister to her and save her soul, Lord. She needs Jesus. She doesn't need to drink. She needs Jesus. I pray, Father, that use me for your glory. Now give us traveling mercies as we go our separate ways and be with us, Lord. Let us greet one another before we leave. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. God bless you tonight.